This is a modern PC game. Interesting architecture, detailed vehicles, everything is so realistic. But behind the scenes are points in various positions. Points become lines in space that form tons of triangles. After texturing, lighting, coloring, and so on, the rendering process forms the images we see. From generating triangles to image output, every step requires a graphics card. As the component with the most transistors, many wonder about what's inside their graphics cards and how they work. In this video, we will use this ROG Strix GeForce RTX 4080 to show you what's inside of a graphics card. Fans on the front help keep the graphics card cool. This is a PCIe interface for data transmission and power delivery. On top is a logo and a power connector. Here there are I.O. ports that can be connected to monitors. Graphics cards are usually installed sideways so the fans face the bottom of the case. I.O. ports will appear at the rear of the case. If you look at the side of the case, you only see the top and back of the graphics card. On the top right, you'll see an external graphics card power connector. After connecting a power cable, the graphics card will have sufficient power. In the past, most graphics cards used 8-pin PCIe connectors providing up to 225 watts of power. Some graphics cards needed multiple 8-pin connectors to get enough power. The ROG Strix RTX 4080 uses the latest 12-volt 2x6 connector. It is very compact, but just a single cable can deliver up to 600 watts of power. Asus designed the BTF graphics card that doesn't need a power cable. It is powered by the motherboard, offering a clean appearance. But you'll need a motherboard with an extra PCIe high power slot. Under a full load, this graphics card can use up to 360 watts. To effectively remove heat, a massive cooling module accounts for 90% of the graphics card's volume. This circuit board is the actual graphics card and the main heat source. The cooling module consists of fans, a fin stack, heat pipes, and a vapor chamber. Core of the cooling solution is its heat pipes. The inner wall of a heat pipe is a porous structure formed by sintered powder. A small amount of water is added inside the heat pipe. Air is removed to create a vacuum, lowering boiling and freezing points. When one side of the heat pipe touches a heat source, the water in that area will evaporate and become steam then drift to the other side where the pressure is lower. Heat is released in that cooler area and the vapor condenses back into liquid water. The condensed water droplets are driven by capillary force and flow back along the porous inner wall, creating a gas liquid cycle, ultimately achieving an efficient transfer of heat. To further improve the heat transfer process, most graphics cards use multiple heat pipes. But there are gaps between the heat pipes in contact with the GPU, and some pipes don't even touch the GPU. Modern graphics cards typically use large copper bases that cover all the heat pipes. Some graphics cards use a vapor chamber with better thermal conductivity than a large copper base. A vapor chamber is like a plate-shaped heat pipe with a very large area. Its thermal conductivity is several times that of a copper base. But heat pipes and vapor chambers offer a limited area for convection, so a large number of fin arrays are required to increase the cooling area. Finally, fans increase airflow to push heat away from the fins. Older graphics cards use downward pressure where air enters from the fans and exits from both sides. Modern graphics cards feature an improved design by allowing heat to vent from a grill in the back plate. This graphics card's fans have a special design. The metal fan and side fans spin in different directions so the air in between flows in the same direction. This is more efficient and reduces noise. The cooling module ensures that the graphics card can run at a comfortable temperature. Underneath lies a compact circuit board, which is the actual graphics card. Except for some scattered capacitors and chips, the circuit board can be divided into four parts from the outside in. The I.O. ports, power solution, video memory, and the GPU. The GPU acts as the brain, taking on almost all computing tasks. Note that GPU doesn't refer to the entire card, but only the chip in the middle. The graphics card includes all the chips, memory, power solution, I.O. ports, circuit board, and the cooling module. GPUs are mainly supplied by Intel, NVIDIA, and AMD. ASUS mainly focuses on circuit board and cooling module design and production. Just like how motherboard components support the CPU, all graphics card components exist to support the GPU. I.O. ports let the graphics card display images on a monitor. This graphics card has two HDMI 2.1 and three DisplayPort 1.4 ports. Different types of I.O. ports allow for different resolutions and refresh rates. The PCIe connector allows the graphics card to exchange data with other components through the motherboard. Data transmission depends on the PCIe version and specification. This RTX 4080 graphics card uses PCIe 4.0 by 16. If the motherboard also supports PCIe 4.0, each channel will transfer 2 gigabytes of data per second. With 16 channels, that means 32 gigabytes of data per second. 
The power solution ensures the graphics card has enough power. Power solution components include PWM chips, capacitors, inductors, and MOSFETs. 12 volts of power enters from the power connector. Then the voltage is stepped down to 1.1 and 1.35 volts so it can be used by the GPU and memory. This graphics card uses a direct power design. A MOSFET and an inductor make up a power phase. 18 phases provide 70 amps each to the GPU while 3 provide 50 amps to the memory. Even under full load, the power phases provide continuous stable power. CPUs temporarily store data in memory. GPUs also need to store data in the memory. These small black blocks are video memory chips. This graphics card uses GDDR6X memory with a frequency of 1400 MHz. Each chip holds 2 GB and has a 32-bit interface width. 8 chips means 16 gigs in a 256-bit bus. The total bandwidth of the video memory is determined by frequency, interface width, and the type of video memory. Video memory frequency determines how many clock cycles can be transferred per second. The memory interface width represents the amount of data that can be transferred each clock cycle. For each cycle, GDDR6X video memory can transfer 16 times more data. After multiplying these numbers and converting bits to bytes, we can determine the total bandwidth is 716.8 gigabytes per second representing the amount of data that the video memory can transfer per second. Generally speaking, the higher a game's resolution is, and the more detailed its textures and models are, the greater the requirements are for video memory capacity and bandwidth. But even with enough video memory, a graphics card's performance is still determined by the GPU. The GPU on this RTX 4080 graphics card is called the AD103-301. It uses NVIDIA's latest Ada Lovelace architecture. The GPU's surface area is only 379 square millimeters, not larger than that of a water bottle cap, yet it is packed with 45.9 billion transistors. The reason for such a high transistor density is TSMC's advanced 5 nanometer lithography process. With NVIDIA's design, TSMC etches intricate circuit patterns through complex production processes on a 12-inch silicon wafer. The large number of transistors inside the GPU form a complex circuit structure that looks just like a miniature city. Most of the circuits you see here can be used for graphics processing. However, we usually use a more simplified diagram to observe the GPU structure. This mainly consists of streaming multiprocessors, L2 cache, an NVENC video encoder, an NVDEC video decoder, a video memory controller, and a PCIe controller. The streaming multiprocessors account for most of the GPU area. They are responsible for almost all the graphics processing. There are 76 SM units in this AD103-300 GPU. Each SM unit contains 128 streaming processors, so there are a total of 9,728 streaming processors altogether. NVIDIA calls these streaming processors CUDA cores. A graphics card with more streaming processors and higher clock frequencies will have better performance. If you think about each SM unit as a CPU core, then this GPU would be equivalent to a CPU with 76 cores in 9,728 threads. But a CPU core is like an experienced mathematician who can handle very complex tasks. Whereas a GPU core is more like a primary school student who can only do four arithmetic operations. This makes the GPU more suitable for simple parallel computing. AI model training and inference, as well as graphics rendering in 3D games, are examples of scenarios that require a high amount of simple calculations. The quantity of graphics card cores offers more efficiency compared to the quality of CPU cores. To understand why graphics cards are more suitable for such processing, we need to first understand how game images are rendered. We'll need to enter the matrix to comprehend the essential process behind graphical rendering. This is a point in space. Two points can be connected to make a line, and three points can form a triangle. Thousands upon thousands of triangles form an exquisite model. Colors and details are required to make it look realistic, so textures are added. In a 3D space, each model has its own position. Every point on each model has coordinates in this space. All the models and their coordinates make up this world. To observe this world, we need to set up a virtual camera. Only models within the camera's view are rendered. 
The positions of each model relative to the camera are constantly recalculated to obtain their new coordinates. Images captured by the camera are put onto a 2D plane. Models in the 3D space must be projected and mapped onto this plane. Finally, we need to display this 2D image on a screen made up of pixels. To reach the final rendered output, we need to calculate the texture, lighting, and color for each pixel separately. After a series of complex calculations, a single frame is finally displayed on the monitor. In the calculation process, the coordinates of vertices in a triangle are typically represented by 32 bits of 0 or 1. The first bit is known as the sine. The next 8 bits are called the exponent. And the last 23 bits are the mantissa. We call this FP32, or Single Precision Floating Point Format. An ideal graphics experience requires over 60 FPS. Each frame requires many precise calculations. The number of calculations per second is used to find a graphics card's rendering performance. The RTX 4080's GPU core can use 9728 CUDA cores to simultaneously perform many single precision floating point operations. At a frequency of 2800 MHz, it can provide about 54 teraflops of single precision floating point computing power. This means that it can perform 54 trillion calculations per second. On the other hand, a high-end CPU like the Intel i9-13900K only has an FP32 performance of 2.5 teraflops. When you compare the two, you'll find that a GPU is much more suitable for graphics rendering than a CPU. Single precision floating point performance mainly affects in-game image rendering. In the RTX 4080 GPU core, all CUDA cores can perform single precision floating point operations. In addition to these operations, the RTX 4080 GPU core is backward compatible with the lower memory half precision floating point FP16 format. However, only half of the CUDA cores support int32 integer calculation. NVIDIA provides the full specifications, including computing performance, of different GPUs on its official website for reference. It's important to note that the computing power of a GPU is related to its architecture. An architecture refers to the design of the GPU. The more advanced a design is, the more efficient a GPU can render graphics given the same computing power. As an example, the GPU architecture of the GTX 1660 is more advanced than that of the GTX 980. Although their FP32 performance is similar, the GTX 1660 has significantly better in-game performance. So when NVIDIA releases GPU performance specs on its official website, it also specifies the GPU architecture. Single precision floating point performance and architecture together determine a GPU's overall gaming performance. Nowadays, GPUs take on many AI-related tasks in addition to being used to play games and render models. To the right of a CUDA core is a fourth generation Tensor Core. These are very suitable for AI-related deep learning calculations. The tensor cores together can provide a total of 780 AI tops of computing power. For example, this AI drawing software can utilize tensor cores to generate images much faster compared to CUDA cores on their own. DLSS compatible games also use tensor cores. Frames are rendered at a lower resolution, and then AI is used to upscale those frames to appear as sharp as the target output resolution, thereby making the game run much smoother. Modern in-game graphics rely on realistic lighting effects. However, the accurate reflection and refraction of light requires massive computing power. In this RTX 4080 GPU, each SM unit has a third generation RT core, or ray tracing core, which are specifically designed to accelerate the calculation of lighting and reflection. These can provide a total of 113 RT T-flops of ray tracing computing power. Ray tracing significantly improves image quality, but it requires an impressive amount of performance. If you are using an entry-level graphics card, it will likely lag once ray tracing is turned on. Ray tracing is most suitable for high-end graphics cards that have superior performance. There are many other important GPU components besides the SM unit. The video decoder allows the graphics card to convert binary video data into a continuous video. If the decoder underperforms, 
a user may experience video stuttering and skipped frames. The video encoder can take video data you filmed and compress it into a desired format and size using modern encoding methods. If the encoder doesn't perform well, a lot of time will be wasted on exporting when editing video. The memory controller facilitates smooth data transferring between the GPU and the video memory. The PCIe controller allows the graphics card to exchange data with the components on the motherboard, such as the CPU, memory, the hard disk, and more. In addition to the above, there are many other auxiliary chips and interfaces on the graphics card circuit board. They work together to help the graphics card operate properly. Asus's product lines are divided into several sub-brands and models. Even when the GPU model is the same, and there may not be a significant difference in graphics performance, high-end product line graphics cards often feature enhanced power delivery, better cooling, lower noise, more overclocking potential, and an exciting appearance. But they are usually more expensive. Entry-level product lines may be inferior to a flagship product when it comes to cooling, noise, materials, and appearance, but they are a more affordable option and great for gamers who are looking for a better cost-to-performance ratio. Deciding between a flagship product and a mainstream graphics card that still performs great will depend on your budget, preference for appearance, noise and temperature tolerance, and whether you plan to overclock your graphics card.